Brandy Kraft is one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history, tied to nearly 70 murders, most in California, but he also paid a short visit to Grand Rapids. 35 years after his arrest, the man who became known as the scorecard killer is still alive on death row in California. Tonight, in a special report, Target 8 investigator Ken Kolker and photojournalist Larry Gron have a story of innocent lives lost, memories that won't fade, and justice unfulfilled. Here's Ken. Randy Kraft spent just four days in Grand Rapids on a business trip. While he was here, he rented a car, got a room, had some drinks, and killed two farm boys. It's a steady climb up and around tree line curves just north of Grand Rapids, past century old farmhouses. In a clearing on the left, a massive water tank, stark white, occupies the high ground. Looking back, not an altogether surprising spot for a stranger in town looking for a quick dumping place. And that's where a consumer's power meter reader found them on December 9th, 1982 a frigid Thursday morning. The bodies of two men, both face up, one naked, the other shoeless and without a coat. We had two bodies that were obviously molested and mutilated and unclothed and dead. They lay feet to feet at a right angle, frozen and partially drifted over with snow. The drag marks left by their heels spoke for themselves. Locals knew they were dealing with a monster unlike anything they had seen here before. You wonder what's going to happen. Is, is this a start of something or is it just an aberration? It wasn't long before they identified the bodies. They were hard-working farm boys, okay? Um, totally dedicated to the lifestyle that they had grown up in. 20-year-old Christopher Schoenborn and his 24-year-old cousin Dennis Alt. It's something that you can only imagine might happen to somebody else, truly. Um, these things don't happen to ordinary people like us. Carol's son, Chris, lived and worked on the family centennial farm in Ottawa County's Wright Township, raising hogs and growing apples. A West Catholic High School graduate, member of the prom court, a natural mechanic, as his mother called him, he was expected one day to help take over the family farm. Danny Alt came from a well-known farm family in the Comstock Park area, a Kennewa Hills High School graduate. He was one of 10 kids, worked on his uncle's farm, loved to hunt, fish, and snowmobile. They were great families. Uh, they, they were kind of, you know, uh, from, from that Fruit Ridge area, they were church people, good people, raised good families. It was Dr. Stephen Cole who examined the bodies. And it was shocking, these were two young men from prominent farming families, uh, known to be in good health, not known to have any bad habits or bad associates. Back then, David Sawyer, now a state appeals court judge, was the Kent County prosecutor. How can you end up with two individuals, two young individuals, 20 and 24 roughly, uh, of, of good physical character, and, and there they are, they've had uh, some mutilation and they uh, obviously had uh, been abused. The cousins were here in downtown Grand Rapids for a horticulture convention, and it was a big deal for food farmers, a chance for them to learn more about their trade and to trade stories. Witnesses last saw them at the Amway Grand Plaza at a popular bar. They never made it home. Well, that was not like him, not to show up for chores in the morning and not to contact us. So in your heart, you know something is very, very wrong. The Alts and Schoenborn search for their sons. Schoenborn's parents sat in the hotel lobby, hoping the two would walk by. You're looking for them. You know, they're missing, where are they? This is the last that we knew they were down there. Dr. Stephen Cole's autopsies raised more questions than they answered. It was brutal, 
Schoenborn had been sexually mutilated with a pen from the Amway Grand Plaza. But Cole found no obvious signs of what killed him. There really was very little in the way of injury, maybe a few scratches, but nothing traumatic, nothing that would have disabled either one of them, or even restrained either one of them. There were no ligature marks on the, on the wrists or ankles. How they could have been at this convention and then nobody saw them leave. And how could anyone have overpowered these two men? Alt was just five foot six and weighed 130 pounds, but Schoenborn was 6'1", weighed 200, and wrestled in high school. So it was hard to conceive that he would, uh, against his will and without incident, uh, have left this convention and ended up dead. It was an, an incredible mystery. Back to our Target 8 report. Detectives had no answers after the frozen bodies of two young men were found dumped in the shadow of a Plainfield Township water tank. Let's go back to Ken. Chris Schoenborn and his cousin Danny Alt, both out for a few drinks, were last seen here at the Amway Grand Plaza, which begs the question, how could one person have overpowered them, left them with no obvious signs of what killed them? The answer to this, as in so many other cases, came from science. Toxicology tests showed both had alcohol in their systems. No surprise there. Witnesses had last placed them at a bar in the Amway Grand Plaza. But the tests also found traces of diazepam, more commonly known as Valium. It would make them very sleepy, and, and indeed it could make them pass out. The combination of alcohol and Valium. The cocktail would have made it easy for a killer to choke them to death without a fight. They'd be either minimally conscious or unconscious, and I think it'd be pretty easy to suffocate them. From there, the investigation stalled. This one just occupied us so much because you sat there and we, we hadn't encountered something like this such a serial killer. We didn't focus strongly in on a suspect. We had no suspect. No answers for two grieving families. Then, in May 1982, six months after the murders, a break in the case, an arrest on a highway 1,800 miles away in sunny Southern California. California Highway Patrol pulled over Randy Kraft for driving erratically in the passenger seat of his Toyota Celica, they found a dying Marine, his last victim. Then, yet another stunning discovery in the trunk of the Celica, a notebook with handwritten cryptic notes on as many as 67 victims dating back to the 1970s. That's more victims than John Wayne Gacy, who buried some of his victims, and Jeffrey Dahmer, who ate some of his. It turns out that Kraft was targeting men, sexually mutilating them. Many, like the victims here in Michigan, were found with Valium in their systems, many dumped near highways. California police sent out a nationwide alert for other victims killed under similar circumstances. Does anyone have information regarding males strangled, diazepam, body parts, uh, mutilated, uh, things of that nature. That caught the attention of Kent County detectives. Believe it or not, about 11 things that they listed and 10 of them were what happened to our victims. And in Kraft's notebook, GR2. And that meant to you? Obviously, those were our two killings here. Within 24 hours, Rusticus and another Kent County detective were flying to L.A. They helped search Kraft's home in Long Beach. That's where they found Schoenborn's mighty Mac jacket, his bottle opener, belt, and boots. In the lost and found at the Amway Grand Plaza, they found Alt's keys. Soon, the Kent County detectives were sitting in the interview room, face to face with Kraft himself. 
Is I've been in Grand Rapids. I know Grand Rapids, but I don't know what you're talking about. He denied killing anybody, denies it to this day. Detectives soon learned that Kraft had visited Grand Rapids for a seminar for California-based Lear Siegler, where he worked as a computer programmer. He's been described as a genius. Records show he spent four days here, stayed in room 1169 at the Amway, rented a Buick Skylark on December 5th, and returned to December 8th, the day of the killings. A co-worker later testified that he and Kraft had drinks with the cousins at the bar. He drinks with them. He becomes acquainted with them very quickly. And while, and obviously if he has a, a, a liking for a person, uh, somehow slips a Mickey into their drink. A Kent County citizen's grand jury indicted Kraft for the murders of Schoenborn and Alt. The former prosecutor says his case was strong. Oh, I think it's very rock solid. You've got, you've got witnesses that put him with these two young men down at Tootsie Van Kelly. Okay, yep. You get the evidence that's found in the room. You get the scorecard that says GR2. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Randy Stephen Kraft, guilty of the crime of felony, murder in the first In 1989, after a jury convicted Kraft of 16 murders in California, West Coast prosecutors were dead set on putting him to death. To bolster their case, California prosecutors reached out to the moms of the murdered cousins from Michigan. Would they fly to Los Angeles to testify? Chris Schoenborn's mom, a devout Catholic, questioned her own beliefs. Could she support taking a life? A jury in California had convicted Randy Kraft of killing 16 men. But prosecutors seeking the death penalty wanted help from the mothers of his victims in West Michigan. Ken Kolker has the rest of the story. As a devout Catholic, Chris Schoenborn's mom struggled with the death penalty, even for the man who killed her son. She went to her priest for answers. He said, you will find in the Bible, it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And he quoted a couple of spots and he said, no, I don't feel, I, I feel that yes, God is his judge, but he has taken lives. He doesn't deserve to live. She remembers Kraft, her son's killer, just 10 feet away from her as she approached the witness stand. He just stared at me, glanced at me. He was sitting there with a tweed jacket on that had patches on the elbows. Like a professor or something. Like a professor. He had a purple shirt on. He was writing, he had a purple tie on and he was writing with a purple pen. You remember all those details? Oh, you bet I do. You bet I do. And when I got past him, I mean, I had cold chills being that close to him. And I, you know, he just looked at me like I was, who the heck are you? Soon, Kraft would learn that these were the moms of the GR2 and that they had names. Guilty of the crime of felony, murder in the first degree. They helped convince a jury to send Kraft to death row. That's where he is still, 73 years old, at the infamous San Quentin prison in San Francisco. Kraft is one of more than 740 on death row in California, by far more than any other state in the country. California has not executed anyone in more than a decade, despite a voter approved proposition in 2016 to speed up the process. Went on the internet, and there he is, he's still, he's still in jail on death row. 30-some years 35 later. 35 years later, at least, if not more. David Sawyer, the former prosecutor now on the Michigan Court of Appeals, only recently learned that Kraft is still alive. If you're gonna have a death penalty, you ought to carry it out. Either, don't, either that or don't have a death penalty. He can't think of anyone who deserves it more. What I feel sorry for are the parents and the people who knew these two young men that have to go through this knowing that there's not a there's not a final decision or something hasn't been done
Or who's paying for all that? Citizens are paying for, for him to stay alive. I think the justice system didn't do their job completely. Do you feel like you got your justice? <sighs> I don't know. I don't really know how I feel about it. Seanborn's mom gets updates on Kraft's federal court appeals every year from the AG's office in California. The United States District Court has denied the petition for... Today, though, she no longer wants the state to kill her son's killer. My feeling about it has totally changed. I feel now that this is the worst sentence for him, is to be on death row. But Seanborn's mom does wonder if a trial in Grand Rapids would have given her more answers about the deaths of her son and his cousin. I guess from the aspect that maybe more would have come out of that, more from the investigation. Like why Kraft chose them and that nagging, baffling question. How in the Dickens did Mr. Kraft manage to haul them into the rental car and take them out to the water tower and dump them. In Michigan, Kent County prosecutors dropped the murder charges against Kraft. It didn't seem worth it. Uh, they had a death penalty. We only had life, no parole. Schoenborn's no mom says she has since tried to learn more about Kraft, even bought a book about him. What is the mind of a serial killer like? What makes them do what they do? Kraft was a high school honors student, played tennis, spent a year in the Air Force, but he also had two prior arrests, both for lewd conduct. She remembers putting the book down, then picking it back up. And I picked it up again, and it opened to the center. You know how the center part will open on a, a paperback, and that had photos in it. And that was the first time I saw a photo that we had never, not been privy to. Chilling crime scene photographs of her son and his cousin. I can't tell you what kind of a reaction I had. I know I fired the book across the room and I never picked it up after that. In the decades since, she has often thought about what the future could have been. Chris should be in that picture. Yeah, he should be in that picture. Probably him and, and the gal that he married. And maybe some grandkids. And maybe some grandkids, yeah. Yep, exactly. Schoenborn's parents have divorced, and the family has sold off most of the farm. Without Chris, they lost interest. What do you think he'd be doing? I think possibly if he <clears throat> was still alive, that our family might still be operating that farm. And Ken, we just watched your chilling report. I can't help but to think about the victims' families and all that they went to to seek justice, and the killer is still on death row. You know, that's the, the part, well, there's so many tragedies here. The what ifs, what if Randy Kraft had never been part of the equation? And they're wondering, you know, some are wondering why he's still part of an equation. Right, yeah. just awful. Now, we, we spoke to a member of Danny Alt's family um, for the story, they did not want to go on camera saying only that they were leaving Kraft's fate in God's hands. We also reached out to Kraft on death row, but never heard back from him. And despite insurmountable evidence, including the dying Marine in his car, he still denies killing anybody. And as for his appeals, there's no telling how much longer they'll go on. Stay right there for a Facebook Live right after this.